Okay, so that covers section 19.4. So let us go ahead and jump into section 19.5, echinoderms and chordates. And those two groups are within the group, the deuterostomes. So upon completion of this section, you should be able to recognize the common characteristics of echinoderms and chordates, describe the defining characteristics of echinoderms, describe the defining characteristics of the invertebrate and vertebrate chordates, and then describe the defining characteristics of each group of vertebrates, which will be fish, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. Okay, so the first group that we're going to primarily focus our attention on is going to be the echinoderms. So echinoderms in the phylum Echinodermata are the phylum of invertebrate animals represented by sea stars and sea urchins. Although from a physical perspective, they may not seem so, echinoderms are the animals most closely related to chordates, which include vertebrates such as humans. And this is because, like chordates, echinoderms are also deuterostomes. There are some defined differences, though. For example, the echinoderms are often radially, not bilaterally symmetrical, but the larva of an echinoderm is a free-swimming filter feeder with bilateral symmetry. But it does go into a metamorphosis into a radially symmetrical adult. Also, adult echinoderms do not have a head, a brain, or segmentation. And the nervous system consists of nerves in a ring around the mouth and extend outwards in a radial fashion. So echinoderm locomotion depends on a water vascular system. So in the sea star, water enters the system through a uh, sevi plate or madrepa and eventually the water is pumped into many tube feet, expanding them. When the foot touches a surface, the center withdraws, producing suction that causes the foot to adhere to the surface. By alternating the expansion and contraction of its many tube feet, a sea star moves slowly along. Echinoderms don't have complex respiratory, excretory, and circulatory systems. Fluids within the coelomic cavity and the water vascular system carry out many of these functions. For example, gas exchange occurs across the skin gills and the tube feet, and nitrogenous waste diffuse through the coelomic fluid and the body wall. Most echinoderms feed variously on organic matter in the sea or in the substrate. But sea stars prey upon crustaceans, mollusks, and other invertebrates. From the human perspective, sea stars cause extensive economic loss because they consume oysters and clams before they can be harvested. However, they are important in many ways. In many ecosystems, fishes and sea otters eat echinoderms, and scientists favor echinoderms for embryological research. So here we have some examples of echinoderm diversity. So in this picture, we have a sea lily, and they are Im immobile, but um, the feather star, which is located um, and the next picture here would be uh, motile. And they usually cling to coral or sponges where they feed on plankton. And then down here, we have a sea cucumber. And they have long leathery bodies that resemble a cucumber, uh, hence the name. And then they do have feeding tentacles about the mouth. Okay. And then here we have a brittle star, and they have a central disc from which long flexible arms are going to radiate. So here's the central disc, and there are the long flexible arms. And then here we have our sea urchins, and this is a sand dollar, and they have spines, and they use those for locomotion, defense, and burrowing. 
OK, so this image kind of shows the basics of sea star anatomy. So many echinoderms, including the sea star, exhibit that radio, radial symmetry as adults. So that is where, when you bisect the individual on uh, any plane in the vertical direction, you will get a mirror image. But they do have a distinct top and bottom side when you have uh, radio, when you are radially symmetrical. Now, um, like we said in the previous slide, um, the sea stars don't necessarily have um, a lot of specialization in some of their features. So they have very basic um, respiratory system, excretory system, and circulatory system, but they do depend on a water vascular system. Okay. Um, and so that water vascular system uh, is through the sevi plates, okay, and here are, is a sevi plate right here, okay. So essentially, water is going to enter the sea star through the sevi plates, and then eventually that water is going to get pumped into all of its feet, okay, uh, or um, I guess extensions of the body, and then through that the two feet are located at the bottom and so once the water vascular system pumps through the body and exits through the two feet which are going to be located at the bottom of the sea star on all of its limbs so to speak or extensions from the body all right so that covers the basic information i expect you to know concerning echinoderms so let us jump into the next major group of deuterostomes, which are going to be our chordates. So at some time in its life history, a chordate in the phylum chordata has the four characteristics as listed on the slide. So the first would be a dorsal supporting rod, and this rod is often called a notochord. The notochord is located just below the nerve cord between the back or dorsal side. And vertebrates have an endoskeleton of cartilage or bone, including a vertebral column that has replaced the notochord during development. Another major feature of chordate is going to be the dorsal tubular nerve cord. The tubular means that the cord contains a canal filled with fluid. And in vertebrates, the nerve cord is protected by the vertebrae. Therefore, it is called the spinal cord because the vertebrae forms the spine. The next major feature is going to be the pharyngeal pouches or pharyngeal slits. And these structures are seen only during embryonic development in most vertebrates. In the invertebrate chordates, the fishes and some amphibian larvae, the pharyngeal pouches become functional gills. Water passes into the mouth and the pharynx goes through the gill slits, which are supported by gill arches. In terrestrial vertebrates that breathe with lungs, the pouches are modified for various purposes. In humans, the first pair of pouches becomes the auditory tubes, and the second pair becomes the tonsils, while the third and fourth become the thymus gland and the parathyroid. And then the last major feature is going to be a tail. And the tail essentially is the structure that extends beyond the anus, and that is why it is called the post-anal tail. So in this image here, we have an embryo, and you can clearly see all of these features in the embryo, and many of these features are often lost or modified heavily once the embryo fully develops into a um, fully functioning um, infant, essentially. And so right here, we have the pharyngeal slits or pharyngeal pouches. Here we have that dorsal tubular nerve cord. The red band here is the notochord. And then we also have that post-anal tail. All right, so to start off our discussion of chordate, we're going to first focus our attention on the invertebrate chordates. So in a few invertebrate chordates, the notochord is never replaced by the vertebral column. In tunicates, this is the case. And tunicates 
live on the ocean floor and take their name from the tunic that makes the adults look like thick-walled uh, squat sacks. They are also called sea squirts because they squirt water from one of their siphons when disturbed. The tunicate larvae is bilaterally symmetrical and has the four chordate characteristics. Metamorphosis produces the sessile adult in which numerous cilia move water into the pharynx and out numerous gill slits. The only chordate characteristics that remain in the adult tunicate. So again, here we have our invertebrate tunicate and the tunicate or sea squirts have numerous gill slits, as you can see in the structure here. And they are the only chordate characteristic that is present and remains uh, identifiable in the adult. Okay. So another invertebrate chordate is going to be the lancelets, and they are a marine chordate that are only a few centimeters long. They have the appearance of a lancet which is a small two-edged surgical knife, and lancelets are found in the shallow water along most coast, where they usually lie partly buried in sandy or muddy substrates, with only their anterior mouth and gill apparatus exposed. They feed on microscopic particles filtered out of the constant stream of water that enters the mouth and exits through the gill slits. Lancelets retain the four chordate characteristics as adults. In addition, segmentation is also present, as witnessed by the fact that the muscles are segmentally arranged and the dorsal tubular nerve cord has periodic branches. <clears throat> so here we have an image of the lancelet, and you can see all of the major characteristics of chordate in the adult also. So here we have the notochord, which is this purple band right there. And then we have the dorsal tubular nerve cord right above it, and it depicted as yellow. There is the um, pharyngeal slits in the pharynx region. And then we have the post anal tail as well. So the adult does retain all of the characteristics that is common and found in chordate at some point during development. <clears throat> Okay, so let us discuss some evolutionary trends that are featured among the chordates. <clears throat> so the chordates are going to be the um, animal groups that we're going to discuss for the remainder of the chapter. Uh, we are going to be looking at a couple of main evolutionary trends that, that distinguish each group of animal from the pre preceding one. The tunicates and lancelets are invertebrate chordates. They don't have vertebrae. But the vertebrates include the fishes, amphibians, reptiles, which include birds and mammals. So as embryos, vertebrates have the four chordate characteristics. But during embryonic development, the notochord is generally replaced by a vertebral column composed of individual vertebrae. Remnants of the nodal cord are seen in the intervertebral discs, which are compressible cartilaginous pads between the vertebrae. The vertebral column, which is a part of the flexible but strong endoskeleton, gives evidence that vertebrates are segmented. Fishes with an endoskeleton of cartilage and some bone in their scales were the first to have jaws. Early bony fishes had lungs. Amphibians were the first group to have jointed appendages and to invade land. The typical life cycle of amphibians includes a larval stage that lives in the water. However, amphibians exploit a wide range of habitats and many reproduce on land. Reptiles, birds, and mammals have a means of reproduction more suited to land. During development, an amnion and other extra embryonic membranes are present, and these membranes carry out all the functions needed to support the life of the embryo as it develops into a young offspring, capable of feeding on its own. So let's look at a visual representation of the many different features and branches of the chordate group. 
So here in this particular image, we are looking at what we call an evolutionary tree, or another name for it would be a phylogenetic tree. And essentially what an evolutionary tree does is it provides a visual representation of the relationships among groups of animals in a particular branch of the kingdom, or any particular branch of organisms. And in this case, we are looking at our chordate group. So among the chordates, we have many, many different subgroups, as you can see up here. And all of these branches and lines represent their relationships. So each of these lines here represent a lineage. And these are the branch points that distinguishes lineages from each other or shows relationships between the different groups. Now, what, what you also see are characteristics. Okay, so here's a characteristic which includes a vertebrae, jaws, bony skeleton, lungs, limb, amniotic egg, and mammary glands. And as you're interpreting this tree, it's important to understand that as we go up in the tree, we get more and more exclusive. Okay. And then as we go down in the tree, we get more and more inclusive. All right. So let's kind of walk through how to interpret the tree. So down here, we have our ancestor. And in this case, because we're looking at chordates, we have some sort of ancestral chordate that all of these lineages descended from. But when we get to the first branch point, that is when these characteristics are going to start separating out different groups. So the first characteristic of note in this tree is going to be the presence or absence of a vertebrae. So all organisms in this branch here have a vertebrae. So that includes all of these groups. Okay. Now any lineages that are on this side of the branch, such as the lancelets and the tunicates, they lack a vertebrae. They do still have a notochord, but they never developed a vertebral column. Okay, so let's jump up to the next characteristic, the next branch point. So the next characteristic is going to be jaws. So among the chordates that do have a vertebrae, there, there is actually a group of that does doesn't have a jaw, which is the next feature. And also the lancelets don't have a jaw and the tunicates don't have a jaw. So that excludes these three groups, but still includes these three. <clears throat> the next one is going to be the bony skeleton. So in this branch, we now have excluded the cartilaginous fishes because they have a cartilage skeleton and not a bony skeleton. But jawless fish also don't have a skeleton, lancelets don't also have a skeleton, and tunicates also don't have a skeleton. Okay, But all of these groups that from this branch point upwards do have a skeleton. The next characteristic is lungs. So all groups on this side of the branch don't have lungs, and all groups on this side do have lungs. And it is the same for the limb. So only these three groups have limbs, and only these two groups have an amniotic egg. And then finally, only mammals have mammary glands. So again, as you go up the tree, you are more exclusive. And then as you go down the tree, you will get more and more inclusive. So you include more and more groups that have the same shared characteristic. OK, so that is the basics on how to interpret this tree. All right, so now that we've talked about the major evolutionary trends in our chordates, let's go and jump into the specifics of some of the major groups of chordates. So the first one that we're going to talk about are our fishes. So the first vertebrates were jawless fishes that wiggled through the water and sucked up food from the ocean floor. Today, there are three living classes of fish. We have our jawless fishes, our cartilaginous fishes, and our bony fishes. The last two groups have jaws, or tooth-bearing bone of the head. And jaws are believed to have evolved from the first pair of gill arches. And those are structures that ordinarily supported the gills. And the presence of jaws permits a predatory way of life. Okay. So here we just have a visual representation showing the evolution of the jaw. And so you see in our jawless fishes, they have all of these gill arches that support the gills. 
And then over time, the first couple of gills began to become modified. So they have a slight modification here to be more bent inward. And then we have a finished and complete jawed fish here where those same gill arches colored in orange are now further modified to form the jaw and also the blue one as well. So again, those gill arches are what eventually became the jaw. So let's look a little bit more closely at our fishes that contain no bones or our non-bony fishes. So living representatives of the jawless fishes are about cylindrical and roughly uh, one meter long. And they have smooth, scaleless skin and no jaws or paired fins. The two groups of living jawless fishes are hagfishes and lampreys. Although both are jawless, there are distinct differences. Hagfishes are an ancient group of fish. They possess a skull, but lack the vertebrae found in other classes of vertebrates. However, molecular evidence suggests that these were once present in these fishes, so they are traditionally classified with the vertebrates. Hagfishes are scavengers, feeding mainly on dead fishes. Lampreys possess a true vertebral column. Most are parasites that use their round mouths as a sucker to attach to another fish and tap into its circulatory system. Unlike other fishes, the lamprey cannot take in water through its mouth. Instead, water moves in and out through the gill openings. Now, the cartilaginous fishes are the sharks, the rays, and the skates, which have skeletons of cartilage instead of bone. The small dogfish shark is often dissected in biology laboratories. One of the most dangerous sharks inhabiting both tropical and temperate waters is the hammerhead shark. The largest sharks, the whale sharks, feed on small fishes and marine invertebrates and do not attack humans. Skates and rays are rather flat fishes that live partially buried in the sand and feed on mussels and clams. Three well-developed senses enable sharks and rays to detect their prey. One, they have the ability to sense electric currents in water, even those generated by the muscle movements of animals. Two, they and all other types of fish have a lateral line system, which is a series of cells that, line, that lie within canals along both sides of the body and can sense pressure caused by a fish or another animal swimming nearby. And then three, they have a keen sense of smell. The part of the brain associated with this sense is twice as large as the other parts. Sharks can detect about one drop of blood in 115 liters or 25 gallons of water. So here we have some visual representations of our jawless fish. And this is an example of a lamprey. So they have a tooth oral disc with no jaw, and they use this disc to suction on to the side of another fish and tap into its circulatory system. And then these are the gill slits located here. And so the water passes into the gill slits and out at the other end to allow the lamprey to have oxygen, oxygen exchange with its gills. So water does not travel through its mouth for that to happen like other types of fishes. And then here we have a bull shark, which is an example of a cartilaginous fish, and they are most noted by their jawed jaw with um, many rows of teeth, and they have many different um, sets of fins. So they have the dorsal fin, the pectoral fins, and the caudal fins, which are over here. And then these are the gill slits of the shark. And unlike the ramplay, the water must pass through the shark's mouth and then come out the gills in order to allow for gas exchange. Okay, so let's focus our attention on the bony fishes now. So bony fishes are by far the most numerous and diverse of all the vertebrates. Most of the bony fishes we eat, such as perch, trout, salmon, and haddock, are ray-finned fishes. Their fins, which are used in balancing and propelling in the, 
the body in water are thin and supported by bony spikes. Rayfin fishes have various ways of life. Some, such as herring, are filter feeders, others, such as trout, are opportunist, and still others, such as piranhas and barracudas, are predaceous carnivores. Rayfin fishes have a swim bladder, which usually serves as a buoyancy organ. By secreting gases into the bladder or absorbing gases from it, these fishes can change their density and thus go up and down in the water. The streamlined shape, fins, and muscle action of rayfin fishes are all suited to locomotion in the water. Their skin is covered by bony scales that protect the body but do not prevent water loss. When ray-finned fishes respire, the gills are kept continuously moist by the passage of water through the mouth and out the gill slits. As the water passes over the gills, oxygen is absorbed by the blood and carbon dioxide is given off. Ray-finned fishes have a single circuit circulatory system where the heart is a simple pump and the blood flows through the chambers, including a non-dividing atrium and ventricle to the gills. Oxygenated blood leaves the gills and goes to the body proper, eventually returning to the heart for recirculation. So here we have the basic anatomy of a ray finned fish. So we have our nostrils and mandible, and then we also have our gill arrangement right here. So in order for them to respire, water passes into the mouth and goes through the gills and then out the gill slits in a continuous motion. And that is where gas exchange takes place. Another noteworthy feature is going to be that swim bladder. And that swim bladder is located right here. And the swim bladder is important in maintaining buoyancy for the fish. Okay. And so they can put gases in the bladder or reabsorb gases out of the bladder to change the density of their body to allow it to sink or float. And then this right here is an example of a rayfin fish. And that is a lionfish. And then I think one more thing I want to point out before I move on is that lateral line system, and that is located right here. And that allows the fish to detect pressure changes in the water to detect the movement of other animals moving around in the water as well. All right. So let's talk about the other major group of bony fish, which are going to be our load fin fishes. So load fin fishes are essentially the group that gave rise to amphibians. So the major difference with low fin fishes is that they have fleshy appendages, meaning that their limbs have muscle attachment within them and are not just rays. So if you look here, we have a fin, and you can also see this part of the limb that has muscle attachment. So if you go back and look at a ray fin fish, notice that the fins just have rays and no muscle attachment. It's just those spines. But if you look at a low fin fish, you do have actual muscle attachment within the limb or the, within the fin of the fish. Okay, And because of this feature, the low fin fishes gave rise to the amphibian group. Okay. And another feature that is also important for the rise of amphibians is the fact that most, but not all, lung or lobe fin fishes respire with lungs. Okay. So they do have gills, but they also have the capacity to respire with lungs as well. All right, so now that we have covered low fin fishes, let us go ahead and jump into the next major group of animals in the chordate group, and that will be amphibians. So the first chordates to make their way to the land environment were the amphibians. Amphibians, whose name means that they live both on land and in the water, are represented today by frogs, toads, newts, and salamanders. Amphibians are variously colored. Some brightly colored ones have skin toxins that sicken or even kill predators. Usually their color pattern is protective because it allows them to remain unnoticed. 
Aside from jointed limbs, amphibians have other features not seen in bony fishes, such as eyelids to keep their eyes moist, a sound producing larynx, um, as well as ears to adapt to picking up sound waves. Their brains are also much larger than that of fish. And then in addition to that, they also have a three chambered heart. But let us jump and talk more specifically about some of these characteristics in amphibians. So adult amphibians usually have small lungs. Air enters the mouth by way of nostrils and when the floor of the mouth is raised, air is forced into the relatively small lungs. Respiration is supplemented by gas exchange through the smooth, moist, uh, glandular skin. The amphibian heart has only three chambers compared with four in mammals. Mixed blood is sent to all parts of the body. Some is sent to the skin where it is further oxidized. Most members of this group lead an amphibious lifestyle, meaning that the larval stage lives in water and the adult stage lives on land. While metamorphosis is a distinctive characteristic of amphibians, some do not demonstrate it. Some salamanders and even some frogs are direct developers. The adults do not return to the water to reproduce and there is no tadpole stage. A, a great variety of reproductive strategies are seen among amphibians. In the gastric brooding frog, the female ingests as many as 20 fertilized eggs, which undergo development in her stomach. And then she vomits them up as tadpoles and or froglets, depending on the species. The great variety of life histories observed among amphibians made them successful colonizers, colonizers of the land environment. However, water pollution and human-made chemicals, such as pesticides, have caused a drastic reduction in amphibian populations worldwide. Many amphibian species are now in danger of extinction. So let's now talk a little bit about reptiles. So the reptiles diversified and were most abundant between 245 and 600 mil or, uh, 66 million years ago, excuse me. These animals included the dinosaurs, which are remembered for their great side. Brachiosaurus, which was a herbivore, was about 23 meters or 75 feet long and about 17 meters or 56 feet tall. Tyrannosaurus rex, which is a carnivore, was 5 meters or 16 feet tall when standing on its hind legs. The bipedal stance of some reptiles was pre-adaptive for the evolution of wings in birds. The reptiles living today include turtles, crocodiles, snakes, lizards, and birds. And the typical reptilian body is covered with hard keratinized scales which protect the animal from desiccation and predators. Reptiles have well-developed lungs enclosed by a protective rib cage. Most reptiles have a three-chambered heart because a septum that divides the third chamber is incomplete. This allows some mixing of oxygen-rich blood with oxygen-poor blood in this chamber. Perhaps the most outstanding adaptation of the reptiles is that they have a means of reproduction suitable to a land existence. The penis of the male passes sperm directly to the female. So fertilization is internal and the female lays leathery flexible shelled eggs. The amniotic egg made development on land possible and eliminated the need for a water environment during development. The amniotic egg provides the developing embryo with atmospheric oxygen, food, and water, removes nitrogenous waste, and protects the embryo from drying out and from mechanical injury. This is accomplished by the presence of extra embryonic membranes, such as the carrion. Fishes, amphibians, and reptiles, other than birds, are what we call ectothermic, meaning that their body temperature matches the temperature of the external environment. It is, if it is cold externally, their internal body temperature is going to drop. If it is hot externally, their internal body temperature is going to rise. 
Most reptiles regulate their body temperature by exposing themselves to the sun if they need warmth and hiding in the shadows if they need cooling off. All right, so here we have a visual representation of the amniotic egg. And in this image, we have some alligators hatching out of its shell. Note that the shell is leathery and flexible and not brittle like a bird's egg. And inside of that egg, the embryo is going to be surrounded by extra embryonic membranes. There are a couple of different membranes of note. The first is going to be the um, chorion, which is right here, and it aids in gas exchange. Another is the yolk, and that provides nutrients. And then the allantosis here is going to be the waste storage membrane. And then the amnion, which is right around the embryo itself is going to enclose the fluid that prevents the drying out of the embryo and as well as provides protection. All right, so let's talk a little bit more specifically about birds, which are within the reptile category. So birds share a common ancestor with crocodiles and have traits such as a tail with vertebrae, clawed feet, and the presence of scales that show they are in fact reptiles. Perhaps you have noticed the scales on the legs of the chicken. And in addition, a bird's feathers are actually modified reptilian scales. However, birds lay a hard shelled amniotic egg rather than the leathery egg produced by other reptiles. The exact history of birds is still in dispute, but recent discoveries of fossils of feathered reptiles in China and other locations indicate that birds are closely related to bipedal dinosaurs and they should be classified as such. Nearly every anatomical feature of a bird can be related to its ability to fly. The forelimbs are modified as wings. The hollow, very light bones are laced with air cavities. A horny beak has replaced jaws equipped with teeth, and a slender neck connects the head to the round, compact torso. Respiration is efficient because the lobular lungs form anterior and posterior air sacs. The presence of these sacs means that the air moves one way through the lungs and gases are continuously exchanged across respiratory tissue. Another benefit of the air sacs is that they lighten the body and aid in flying. Birds have a four chambered heart that completely separates oxygen rich blood from oxygen poor blood. Birds are endothermic and generate internal heat. Many endotherms can use met metabolic heat to maintain a constant internal temperature. This may be associated with their efficient nervous, respiratory, and circulatory systems. Also, their feathers provide insulation. Birds have no bladder and excrete uric acid in a semi-dry state. Birds have particularly accurate vision and well-developed brains. Their muscle reflexes are excellent. These adaptations are suited to flight. An enlarged portion of the brain seems to be the area responsible for instinctive behavior. A ritualized courtship often precedes mating, and many newly hatched birds require parental care before they are able to fly away and seek food for themselves. A remarkable aspect of bird behavior is the seasonal migration of many species over very long distances. Birds navigate by day and night whether it's sunny or cloudy, by using the sun and stars and even the Earth's magnetic field to guide them. All right, so here we have the basic anatomy of a bird and you can see the many adaptations that allow the bird to fly. So for example, we have feathers and hollow bones that provide um, lift and loss of weight in the bird to allow the bird easier access to flight. Um, we also have a beak that reduces the structures of teeth so because the teeth is just added weight. Um, the respiratory system allows for air sacs to exist and these air sacs help keep the bird light as well as provides more efficient gas exchange. The respite, uh, the um, 
and digestive system, excuse me, is also modified to help with flight where the bird does not necessarily excrete um, separate waste. Uh, so all of its waste goes together and comes out of the cloaca so it doesn't have a bladder. And its muscles and limbs are also completely modified for efficient flight as well. So traditionally, the classification of birds was particularly, particularly based on beak and foot types, and to some extent on habitat and behavior. The various orders include birds of prey with notched beaks and sharp talons, shorebirds with long slender probing bills and long stilt-like legs, and woodpeckers with sharp chisel-like bills and grasping feet, and waterfowl with web toes and broad bills, and then you have penguins with wings modified as flippers, and songbirds with perching feet. Genetic data now, use, now is used to determine relationships among birds, but we can see a lot of commonality and features depending on the lifestyle of the bird and the habitat that they inhabit. So in this particular side, we can see all the different types of bird beaks uh, and examples of bird beaks. So this is a cardinal, and a cardinal's beak allows it to crack into seeds based off its modifications. A flamingo's beak is modified to allow for the um, straining of food from the water, and it has bristles inside of, of its beak that fringe into the mandible to allow this to happen. And then we also have an eagle with its beak that allows it to tear prey apart. Okay, so the last major group of chordates that we're going to talk about are going to be the mammals. And mammals are in the class Mammalia, and they are amniotes, and as such, they share a common ancestor with reptiles. However, mammals represent a separate evolutionary lineage from the reptile lineage that lead, led to the birds. The first mammals evolved during the Triassic period, which was around 199 million years ago or so, and they were small and about the size of a mouse. Due to many factors, including the dominance of the dinosaurs, mammals changed little during the Triassic and Jurassic periods. Some of the earliest mammalian groups are still represented by the monotremes and the marsupials. However, neither of these groups is abundant as the placental mammals, which can be found in most environments on the planet. The two chief characteristics of mammals are hair and milk producing mammary glands. Almost all mammals are endotherms and generate internal heat. Many of the adaptations of mammals are related to temperature control. Hair, for example, provides insulation against heat loss and allows mammals to be active even in cold weather. Mammary glands enable females to feed or nurse their young without leaving them to find food. Nursing also creates a bond between mother and offspring that helps ensure parental care while the young are helpless. In most mammals, the young are born alive after a period of development in the uterus, and a part of the which is a part of the uh, female reproductive system. Internal development shelters the young and allows the female to move actively about while the young are maturing inside of her. So let's jump into mammal diversity. <clears throat> so the first two groups of mammals we're going to talk about are the monotremes and the marsupials. So monotremes are mammals that, like birds, have a cloaca, which is a terminal region of the digestive tract that serves as a common chamber for feces, excretory waste, and sex cells. They also lay hard-shelled amniotic eggs. They are represented by the spiny anteater and the duck-billed platypus, both of which live in Australia. The female duck-billed platypus lays her eggs in a burrow in the ground. She incubates the eggs, and after hatching, the young lick the milk that seeps from the mammary gland on her abdomen. The spiny anteater has a pouch on the belly side forming, formed by swollen mammary glands and longitudinal muscles. Hatching takes place in this pouch and the young remain there for about 53 days. Then they stay in a burrow where the mother periodically visits and nurses them. 
Now, the young of marsupials begin their development inside the female's body, but they are born in a very immature condition. Newborns crawl up into a pouch and into their mother's abdomen, and inside the pouch, they attach to the nipples of mammary glands and continue to develop. Frequently, more are born than can be accommodated by the number of nipples. The Virginia possum is the only marsupial north of Mexico, and in Australia, Marsupials underwent adaptive radiation for several million years without com competition. Thus, marsupial mammals are now found mainly in Australia, with some in Central and South America as well. Among the herbivorous marsupials, koalas are tree-climbing browsers, and kangaroos are grazers. The Tasmanian wolf or Tasmanian tar tiger are now known to be extinct, but it was a carnivorous mammal Mar uh, a carnivorous marsupial, excuse me, about the size of a collie dog. So here we have a couple of examples of these two groups of mammals. So this is the spiny anteater, and it is a monotreme that lives in Australia. Another name for this animal is echidna. Okay. Here we have two examples of marsupials. This is a koala, which is our marsupial found in Australia. And then this is the Virginia possum, which is found in North America. And again, the big difference between these groups is that the echidna or the spiny anteater lays eggs, whereas in marsupials, they, the baby starts out in the uterus and is born very, very early and very underdeveloped. But then it continues development in the pouch of the female, which is usually located somewhere in her abdomen. Okay. Now, the vast majority of living mammals are actually placental mammals. And in these mammals, the extra embryonic membranes of the amniotic egg have been modified for internal development within the uterus of the female. The uh, chorion contributes to the fetal portion of the placenta, while a part of the uterine wall contributes to the maternal portion. Here, nutrients, oxygen, and waste are exchanged between fetus and maternal blood. Mammals are adapted to life on land and have limbs that allow them to move rapidly. The brain is well developed, the lungs are expanded, not only by the action of the rib cage, but also by the contraction of the diaphragm, which is a horizontal muscle that provides the thoracic cavity, that divides the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. And there is also a heart with four chambers. The internal temperature of mammals is constant and hair, when abundant, helps insulate the body. The mammalian brain is enlarged due to the expansion of the cerebral hemispheres that control the rest of the brain. The brain is not fully developed until after birth, and the young learn to take care of themselves during a period of dependency on their parents. Mammals can be distinguished by their method of obtaining food and their mode of locomotion. For example, bats have membranous wings supported by digits, Horses have long hoofed legs, and whales have paddle-like forelimbs. The specific shape and size of the teeth may be associated with whether the mammal is a herbivore, a carnivore, or an omnivore, where a herbivore eats plants, a carnivore eats meat, and an omnivore eats both meat and plants. For example, mice have continuously growing incisors, Horses have long grinding molars, and dogs have long canine teeth. So here we just have a couple of visual examples of placental mammals, and I'm sure you are familiar with many of these, but we have a deer who are her herbivores that live in wooded areas. And then you have um, a lion that is native to the African plains. And then we also have um, monkeys that are typically inhabit tropical forests and are arboreal uh, for the most part. And then we have uh, many um, sea dwelling mammals in the whale and dolphin group 
And this is a, an example. This is a orca, which is in the dolphin family. And these are all examples of the placental mammals, and they are the most widespread and diverse group of mammals today. OK, so that finishes up section 19.5. So let us go ahead and go into the last section, which is 19.6, human evolution. Upon completion of this section, you should be able to summarize the evolutionary relationship of the primates, describe evolutionary trends among the hominids, and summarize the replacement model hypothesis for the evolution of modern humans. So in the evolutionary tree, you can see that all primates share one common ancestor and that the other types of primates diverge from the human line of descent, also called a lineage over time. The prosimians include the lemurs, tarsiciers, and lorises, and the anthrop anthropoids include the monkeys, apes, and humans. The designation hominid includes the apes, both African and Asian, as well as chimpanzees, humans, and the closest extinct relatives of humans. The term hominid refers to our species, Homo sapiens, and our close human-like ancestors. Primates are adapted to an arboreal life, or life in trees, and primate limbs are mobile, and the hands and feet have five digits each. Many primates have both an opposable big toe and an opposable thumb. That is, the big toe and the thumb can touch each of the other toes and fingers. Humans don't have an opposable big toe, but the thumb is opposable, resulting in a grip that is both powerful and precise. The opposable thumb allows a primate to easily reach out and bring food, such as fruit, to its mouth. When mobile, primates grasp and release tree limbs freely because nails have replaced claws. The evolutionary trend among primates is generally towards a larger and more complex brain. The brain is smallest in prosimians and largest in modern humans. In humans, the cerebral cortex has many associations and has expanded so much it has become extensively folded. The portion of the brain devoted to smell got smaller and the portion devoted to sight increased in size and complexity during primate evolution. Also, more and more of the brain is involved in controlling and processing information received from the hands and the thumb. The result is a good eye-hand coordination in humans. Notice that prosimians were the first type of primate to diverge from the human line of descent, and apes and chimpanzees were the last group to diverge from our line of descent. The evolutionary tree also indicates that humans are most closely related to these primates. One of the most unfortunate misconceptions concerning human evolution is that Darwin and others suggested that humans evolved from apes. On the contrary, humans and apes share a common ape-like ancestor. Today's apes are our distant cousins, and we couldn't have evolved from our cousins because we are contemporaries living on Earth at the same time. Dating the last common ancestor for apes and humans is an active area of research, but most researchers estimate that the ancestor lived around 7 million years ago or so. So here is the evolutionary tree of primates, and primates are descended from an ancestor that may have resembled a tree shoe, shrew, which is down, down here. The descendants of this ancestor adapted to the new way of life and developed traits such as shortened snouts and nails instead of claws. The time when each type of primate diverged from the main line of descent is known from the fossil record. So this is where the millions of years ago are coming from. And a common ancestor was living at each point of the divergence. So these are again our divergence points or our branch points. For example, a common ancestor of hominids, that, that is being our humans, apes, and chimpanzees, existed about 7 million years ago. So if you trace that back over here, it's roughly 7 million years ago. And 
for the one of arthropods, it was about 45 million years ago. So that's this one right here. And so that is the basics of the evolutionary tree of primates. <clears throat> okay. So there have been many recent advances in the study of the hominins and recent discoveries of fossils in Africa are challenging our view of how early hominins evolved. Paleontologists use certain anatomical features when they try to determine if a fossil is a hominin. These features include bipedalism or walking on two feet, the shape of the face and the brain size. Today's humans have a flatter face and a more pronounced chin than do the apes because the human jaw is shorter than that of the apes. Then too, our teeth are generally smaller and less specialized. We don't have the sharp canines of an ape, for example, and chimpanzees have a brain size of about 400 cubic centimeters, and modern humans have a brain size of about 1,360 cubic centimeters. So early hominids are represented by the orange colored bars in uh, this particular figure, which is located right here. So these are our early hominids. Scientists have found several fossils dated around the time the ape lineage and human lineage are believed to have split. And one of these is the Sahelotrophic uh, tectonius, and only the brain case has been found and dated at 7 million years ago. Although the brain case is very ape-like, the location of the opening for the spine at the back of the skull suggests bipedalism. Also, the canines are smaller and the tooth enamel is thicker than in an ape. Another early hominid, which is Ardipithecus ramidus, is represented is a representative of the Arpithecans of about 4.5 million years ago. The fossil remains of this the fossil remains of this species are commonly called the Ardi. And reconstruction of the fossils suggests that the species was bipedal and that some individuals may have been 122 centimeters tall. The teeth seem intermediate between those of early apes and those of later hominids. And recently, fossils dated at 4 million years ago show a direct link between A. ramidus and the Australopithecans, which we will discuss next. Okay, so here are our two early human-like hominids that we were discussed in the previous slide. <clears throat> and then we have some of our next group, which is the Australopithecans that we're going to talk about next. And then in the Homo group, those are the ones that are most closely related to us. And then in this figure, we have the reconstruction of the fossil remains of Ardipithecus ramidus, or Ardi, and that suggests that the species was well adapted for life both in the trees and on the ground. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the next major group of hominids, which are gonna be the Australopithecans. So it's impossible, it is possible that one of the Australopithecans, which is a group of hominids that evolved and diverged in Africa about 4 million years ago, is a direct ancestor of humans. More than 20 years ago, a team led by Donald Johansson unearthed nearly 250 fossils of a hominid called Australopithecans afarnius and a now famous female skeleton dated to 3.18 million years ago is known worldwide by its field name, Lucy. Although her brain was quite small, about 400 um, cubic centimeters, the shapes and relative proportions of Lucy's limbs indicate that she stood upright and walked bipedally. Even better evidence of bipedal locomotion comes from a tail, tra a trail of 
footprints dating about 3.7 million years ago. The larger prints are double as though a smaller individual was stepping in the footfalls of another and that there are additional small prints off to the side with um, within hand holding distance, as you can see right here. All right, so one species, which would be Australopithecans sedibae, sed sed demonstrates that the transition to bipedalism occurred gradually over time in the Australopithecans. An analysis of limb size and the method of walking in a sedidaba suggests that changes in the pelvis occurred at different rates than those in the limbs. And in many ways, a sedidaba is ape-like above the waist or small brain and human-like below the waist, walking erect, ind indicating that human characteristics did not evolve all at one time. The term mosaic evolution is applied when different body parts change at different rates and therefore at different times. Okay, so just to point out a few things with these figures. So the figure noted here is a reconstruction of Lucy on display at the St. Louis Zoo. And down here is these uh, the fossilized footprints that occur in ash from a volcanic eruption some 3.7 million years ago. Again, the large foot trails are double, and then the third smaller trail is from a smaller individual walking uh, along to the side. So it is suggested that a female was holding the hand of a youngster, and they may have been walking in the footprints of a male in front of them. And the <clears throat> These footprints suggest that a Afarnensis walked bipedally. All right, so another group of hominids that we'll talk about are going to be Homo habilis. Homo habilis, dated between 2.4 and 1.4 million years ago, may be an ancestor to modern humans. Some of these fossils have a brain size as large as 775 um, cubic centimeters, which is about 45% larger than that seen in A. afrinensis. The cheek teeth are smaller than those of any of the other Australopithecans. Therefore, it is likely that these early homos were omnivorous and ate meat in addition to plant material. Bones at the campsites of H. habilis bear cut marks, indicating that these hominids were named, which whose name means handyman, used tools to strip the meat from the bone. The rather crude tools, probably also used to scrape hide and cut tendons, consisted of sharp flakes of broken rock. The skulls of H. habilis suggest that the portions of the brain associated with speech areas were enlarged. We can speculate that the ability to speak may have led to hunting, cooper hunting cooperatively. Some members of the group may have remained plant gatherers, and if so, both hunters and gatherers most likely ate together and shared their food. In this way, society and culture could have begun, and culture, which encompasses human behavior and products such as technology and the arts, is dependent on the capacity to speak and transmit knowledge. We can further speculate that the advantages that having a culture brought to H. habilis may have hastened the extinction of the Australopithecans. So the next major group of hominids we're going to talk about are going to be Homo erectus. So fossils of Homo erectus have been found in Africa, Asia, and Europe, and dated between 1.9 and 0.15 million years ago. Although all fossils assigned to the name H. erectus are similar in appearance, there is enough discrepancy to suggest that several different species have been included in this group. Compared with H. habilis, H. Erectus had a larger brain, about 1,000 cubic, cubic centimeters, and a flattened, and a flattened or flatter face. 
The recovery of an almost complete skeleton of a 10-year-old boy indicates that H. erectus was much taller than the earlier hominids. Males were about 1.8 meters tall, or about 6 feet, and females were about 1.55 meters tall, or approximately 5 feet. Indeed, these hominins were erect and most likely had a striding gait, like that of modern humans. The robust and most likely heavily muscled skeleton still retained some Australopithecian features, and even so, the size of the birth canal indicates that infants were born in an immature state that required an extensive period of care. It is believed that H. erectus first appeared in Africa and then migrated into Asia and Europe. And at one time, the migration was thought to have occurred about 1 million years ago. Recently, however, H. erectus fossil remains in Java and the Republic of Georgia have been dated at 1.9 and 1.6 million years ago, respectively. These remains push the evolution of H. erectus in Africa to an earlier date that has yet to be determined. In any case, such an extensive population movement is a first in the history of humankind and a tribute to the intellectual and physical skills of the species. A directus was also most likely the first hominid to use fire, and it fashioned more advanced tools than the earlier um, Homo species. These hominids use heavy teardrop shaped axes and cleavers, as well as stone flakes that were probably used for cutting and scraping. Some investigators believe H. erectus was a systematic hunter that took kills to the same site over and over again. In one location, researchers have found over 40,000 bones and 2,647 stones. These sites could have been home bases where social interactions occurred and a prolonged childhood allowed time for learning. Perhaps a language evolved and a, cult and a culture more like our own developed as well. Okay, so here we have the migration of Homo erectus, and the dates that you see are the dates that indicate the migration of the early Homo erectus from Africa. So they started in Africa, and then they made their way to Eurasia, China, and Indonesia in succession. All right, so let's discuss the evolution of what we know as the modern human. So the most widely accepted hypothesis for the, modern, for the evolution of modern humans from early human-like hominids is referred to as the replacement model or out of Africa hypothesis, which proposes that modern humans evolved from our Archaic humans only in Africa and then migrated to Asia and Europe, where they replaced the Archaic species about 100,000 years before the present. However, even this hypothesis is being challenged as new genomic information on the Neanderthals and Denisovians becomes available. So this is a, a representation of the replacement model. And according to the replacement model, modern humans evolved in Africa only and then re replaced all other early homo species in um, Asia and Europe. And that is how we ended up uh, with our current understanding of modern humans. But of course, as we continue to learn more genomic information, there is some uh, challenge to this idea. All right, so let's talk about the next group of hominids, which will be our Neanderthals. And Neanderthals take their name from Germany's Neander Valley, where one of the first Neanderthal skeletons dated some 200,000 years before the present was discovered. The Neanderthals had massive brow ridges and their nose, jaws, and teeth protruded far forward. Their forehead, was low and sloping, and their lower jaw lacked a chin. And new fossils show that their pubic bone was larger and longer than that of modern humans. 
According to the replacement model, Neanderthals were eventually supplemented by modern humans. However, this traditional view is being challenged by studies of the Neanderthal genome, which was completed in 2010, which suggests not only that Neanderthals interbred with Homo sapiens, but also that between 1% and 4% of the genome of non-African Homo sapiens contains remnants of the Neanderthal genome. Some scientists are suggesting that Neanderthals were not a separate species, but simply a race of Homo sapiens that was eventually absorbed into the larger population. Research continues into these and other hypotheses that explain these similarities. Physiologically, the Neanderthal brain was, on average, slightly larger than that of Homo sapiens, which was about 1,400 cubic centimeters compared to the 1,360 cubic centimeters of most modern humans. The Neanderthals were heavily muscled, especially in the shoulders and neck, and the bones of the limbs were shorter and thicker than those of modern humans. It is hypothesized that a larger brain than that of modern humans was required to control the extra musculature. And the Neanderthals lived in Europe and Asia during the last ice age, and their sturdy build could have helped with uh, their body's conservation of heat. The Neanderthals give evidence of being culturally advanced. Most lived in caves, but those living in the open may have built houses. They manufactured a variety of stone tools, including spear points, which could have been used for hunting. And scrapers and knives could have helped in food preparation. They most likely successfully hunted bears, woolly mammoths, uh, rhinoceroses, reindeer, and other contemporary animals. They used and could control fire, which probably helped them cook meat and keep themselves warm. They even buried their dead with flowers and tools and may have had a religion. Perhaps they believed in life after death. If so, they were capable of thinking symbolically. So let's talk a little bit about the Denisovians. So in 2008, <clears throat> a fragment of a finger bone was discovered in Denisovia cave in southern Siberia. Initially, scientists thought it might be the remains of a species of early Homo, possibly related to Homo erectus. However, mitochondrial DNA indicated that the fossil belonged to a species that existed around 1 million years ago, around the same time as Neanderthals. The analysis suggested that the Denisovians and Neanderthals had a common ancestor, but did not interbreed with one another, possibly because of their geographic location. However, what is interesting is the fact that Homo sapiens in the oceanic region, being New Guinea and nearby islands, share around 5% of their genome with the Denisovians. In 2014, researchers reported that an allele in modern Tibetans that allows for high, ev high elevation living originated with the Denisovians, and a recent discovery of a jawbone in 2019 in Tibet suggests that Denisovians occupied the region long before Homo sapiens arrived. When coupled with the Neanderthal dat data, this suggests that modern Homo sapiens did not simply replace groups of archaic humans, but may have instead assimilated them through interbreeding. And scientists are just beginning to unravel the implications of this Denisovian discovery. Okay. And the last major group of hominids we'll discuss are going to be Cro-Magnons. Cro-Magnons represent the oldest fossils to be designated as Homo sapiens, and Cro-Magnons, who are named after a location in France where their fossils were first found, had a thoroughly modern appearance. They made advanced tools, including compound tools, such as a stone flakes fitted in wooden handles. They may have been the first to make knife-like blades and to throw spears, enabling them to kill animals from a distance. They were such accomplished hunters that some researchers believed they were responsible for the extinction of many larger mammals, such as the giant sloth, 
mammoth, a saber-toothed tiger, and the giant ox. Cro-Magnons hunted cooperatively and were perhaps the first to have a language. They are believed to have lived in small groups, with the men hunting by day while the women remained at home with the children, gathering and processing food items. Probably, the women also were engaged in maintenance tasks. The Cro-Magnon culture included art. They sculpted small figurines out of reindeer bone and antlers. They also painted beautiful drawings of animals, some of which have survived on cave walls in Spain and France. And that concludes the last of the topics for chapter 19. I hope everyone has a wonderful week.